All right, good morning, everyone. Um, we wanted to officially welcome you to our webinar on the ABCs of giving personalized feedback. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, again, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce myself and Brainerd Strategy. My name is Sarah Pollan, and I will be helping with the more technological aspects of today's webinar to make sure that everything runs smoothly. I am a consultant here at Brainerd Strategy. We are a nationally recognized management consulting firm that specializes in leadership, development, and organizational development. We have been working in this space for over 10 years, and we are known for our innovative and thought-provoking approach to developing leaders. Throughout our time together today, we will be sharing, as I mentioned, for those of you that joined us just a few minutes earlier, we will be sharing polls and chat questions to understand a little bit more about our audience. Our facilitator, Kay Bassey, will mention when it is time for you to take a poll and you will see a window pop up with poll questions for you to provide your responses. We will then be sure to share the results with you to better understand your, audience, your peers and those that are, have joined us for the webinar as well. For chats, there will also be an opportunity to provide some open-ended responses. If you look at the bottom of your screen or perhaps the top of your screen, you have a black menu bar. On that menu bar, most likely on the right hand side, you will see an icon with a speech bubble. This is where you can provide, you can click on and a chat window will pop up in which you can provide your responses. If you have any technical questions throughout the webinar, please submit them through the Q&A function that you will also find on that black bar. One of our team members will be sure to support you and get back to you with an answer. Then we will have the opportunity to take questions regarding the content that we cover today during a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if anything does pop up, uh, we most likely won't respond to the content questions throughout, but we'll have the opportunity to get to that and give you some time towards the end. Now, with that being said, I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce you to our facilitator of today's webinar, Kay Bassey. Kay is our Executive Vice President of Business Operations and Strategy here at Brainerd Strategy. She has been the driving force behind our operational efficiency, capacity, and profitability. On top of that, we asked Kay to facilitate our webinar today because she really practices what she preaches. She embodies and drives our core values on a daily basis. And I personally have received feedback and coaching from her on multiple occasions, and trust me, she's darn good at it. So with that being said, I will hand it over to Kay to kick us off and tell us a little bit more about providing personalized feedback. Too much credit there, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. I hope the next 30 to 40 minutes are going to be of value to you as we take a good hard look at this F word in the leadership language, feedback. Now, what I mean by that is we're going to be unpackaging why feedback is the primary driver of performance. And if it is this primary driver of performance, what is preventing us from giving feedback and giving it effectively? See, feedback allows us to enforce the positive performance, the positive behaviors we want to see, and also extinguishes the negative performance. And so I'd love to offer you some simple and easy to implement tools and techniques that we often use here at Brain Art Strategy to help deliver feedback to drive those results. As Sarah mentioned, we're going to have some time for Q&A at the end. But before we get there, I think it's essential for us to first consider the importance of honing a performance mindset and how we are responsible for driving that performance. Now, there are various, um, there, oh, I think my screen froze, that's better. Um, so there are various roles that we play in a, leadership capacity to drive performance. But I want to point these out a little bit more to us. The first is the role of a manager. Here you are to monitor performance, you are to measure performance, and you're to give direction, right? Then the second is that of a leader. We are to drive performance in others, perhaps by inspiring them, perhaps by giving a vision of a future state. And the third is this often overlooked role and crucial role that we play as a coach. Here we are to, to build performance in others, to pull performance along. So let's take a moment to really dive into this third hat that we wear, this often deprioritized hat that we wear as a coach. Now, Coaching 
is inefficient and coaching can take a lot of our time but coaching also is not advice giving it is not an event coaching is a facilitated process that allows the individual to have some self-discovery and development and coaching is a skill at your disposal that gets somebody to want to change their own behavior now think about this it's such an important skill because when coaching or when development or the answers to my own development areas comes from within i'm more likely to implement them there's some stickiness around that and study after study has shown us this that is why coaching can be so significant for us it is highly powerful now there are various coaching models at your disposal um, in the public domain i would encourage you to seek these out and some of them are very good ones there may even be a coaching framework deployed at your organization, which your company stands behind. Good, you should seek it out and use, right? But for today, I want to share a simple coaching lens that we often use here at Brain Art Strategy. This inward, outward, forward lens view is really helpful to me when I'm guiding development conversations. You want to first start with looking inward. You want to challenge the individual to gain some self insights and self awareness around their own behavior. You then want them to look outward. Once they've had that introspection to look out into the environment, into the ecosystem, you want to challenge them to examine where this behavior has turned up and how it's being received by those around them, by the stakeholders attached to this individual. Then once you are here, you can truly begin to look forward. Here the individual can action plan to close a development gap, to take a step towards a better state. Now think about this. Through this coaching lens, you are able to get the individual in a safe, non-threatening manner to challenge their thinking about their own performance, about their own behavior in a way likely they wouldn't be able to get to on their own. That is why many of us don't realize what an incredible superpower we possess with coaching. Coaching is giving you the ability to challenge and change the behaviors of others. It's powerful. Sarah, I'd love to do a quick poll here to consider the last 30 days. What percent of your time have you spent coaching or holding development conversations with others? And just give us one moment and we will share that poll with you. Again, as Kay said, what percent of your time do you spend coaching? And more in particular, uh, maybe framing that around the past 30 days. And we will provide just a few more seconds as people are starting, as responses are still quick trickling in from our participants. But as we're seeing our responses roll in, it looks like the majority of you are spending approximately 10% of your time or have spent approximately 10% of your time in the last 30 days. Now you should have the opportunity to see the distribution of all of our responses as well. Yeah, that's right. So 10%, that's not surprising. That's typically what we see, Sarah, when it, about right. yeah, when it comes to coaching. I mean, I mentioned this before, coaching is inefficient. And although coaching is an effective tool, it's highly inefficient. It requires a lot of your time, investment, and your energy. So that is why you don't want to be coaching all the time. And you definitely don't want to be coaching everyone. And we're going to cover this a little bit later. The primary takeaway, though, is that you don't necessarily want to be hitting that 75% mark. It's not an efficient use of your time. See, coaching is a skill that you should use deliberately and intentionally at your discretion. And what we mean by that is only when you truly care to do so. 
you need to be mindful about when you coach with that capital C, that facilitated process we spoke about earlier, giving your time, giving your investment versus choosing when you are simply going to apply a coaching skill in a conversation. Those two are different. And here are examples of the top five coaching skills that we consider at Brain Art Strategy to effectively drive coaching, uh, the coaching process. And we're going to be digging into many of these at a future webinar. But for the interest of today, I really want to spend our time unpackaging skill number four, giving feedback. And the question you should be asking yourself here is why? Why out of these five? are we just focusing on feedback? And the answer is that it turns out feedback is the primary skill that intercepts all three roles. That is how powerful feedback is in driving performance that really matters. So if feedback is this big powerful tool, if it's effective, what is preventing us from giving feedback? What is holding us back from driving performance and giving this feedback. What are some of the barriers that you're seeing? Let's do a quick chat here, Sarah. Certainly. And as I mentioned before, there should be a chat function in your uh, gray or black bar, either at the top or the bottom of your screen. We're starting to see a few responses rolling in. Fear, <laughs> my own ego, appreciate the yeah, candor. Yeah. <laughs> Ban managers do not like confrontation. Yeah, I think that's a very, very real threat to a lot of managers, you know. Very Which true. We also see, oh, time consuming, or I'm not quite sure what to say, right? I think yeah. that's so common. We're not quite sure exactly how to frame or approach that conversation. Right, right. Making sure it's worded just the right way, certainly right along those same lines. It seems like feedback can take a lot of our thought and mental energy so that we have to deliver it right, right? It's not part of our culture. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. We've seen that as well. Some great responses coming in here, guys. Often reactive, right? Yeah. It can be either reactive, the person providing, or what we receive from others. Yeah, see... I can, I think I can relate to majority of these. I think we can all manage, especially in a management executive capacity, a leader capacity. But I think the turning point for me when I realized that I were, my comfort or my discomfort really was preventing me from, from giving feedback was when I had this aha moment that I was actively choosing to withhold the primary key to someone else's success and their performance because I was uncomfortable with how they might react or what they might think about me. I'm, I'm supposed to inspire these. And so it was difficult sometimes to have that confrontation, but I was choosing to withhold that. I was literally standing in the way of their success, their growth, simply because my own ego was conflict averse. And that's a pretty tough pill to swallow. So I started practicing giving feedback. I started to use this muscle. Rather than shying away from it, I started to lean into it. And with time, I just got more comfortable with giving feedback. I also realized the psychological impact and significance that my feedback was actually having in a constructive way to those who were the recipients of it. And so as I was preparing for this webinar, I record an earlier um, um, experience of what feedback, especially via coaching, had done for one member of our team. And I'd love to share it as an example for you. So I was asked to coach an individual who was smart, highly capable, right? High performer, great potential there in terms of the potential to perform. But his performance was not on par with his tenure in the role, we, just something was amiss. Like he had all the tools, he was smart and everything, but there was something that was not necessarily delivering the success and behaviors that we would wanna see here at our company. And so during one of our development conversations, I started to probe 
I got the individual to explore what does he measure success to be in his role? I challenge him to look outward and say, all right, you've got a good assessment of what you think. Let's go and get some feedback by seasoned, seasoned members in the team and some of your stakeholders. What behaviors around our values are typically leading to success at our organization? And what behaviors do you, might, do you need to display in your role and capacity to, that will lead to success? Get their opinions, get their feedback. And it was just simply going through this inward outward and getting this rich feedback that he realized he was bringing in his own sack of experiences and perspectives, right? What made him successful in his previous company, in his previous role, was not what would make him successful in this role. The breakthrough that this individual experienced through feedback was incredible. He built an actionable, I would say a digestible development plan and decided to move forward. I think I remember the performance improving almost overnight. His manager and I started to get feedback or just call-ins like, oh my goodness, he is starting to show up like we need him to. And pretty soon the feedback started to turn into what an A player this emerging lead leader is becoming. So let's think about this. Nothing changed in his circumstance, right? The role was still the same. The people and players were still the same. The culture was still the same. It's just that he simply realized he had been facing the wrong direction. And because of this feedback, he was not able to just see that he's facing the wrong direction. He was able to pivot accordingly. Now, I'm not saying with this example that all, field, or all feedback yields overnight results. It doesn't. But this experience is anecdotal of the fact that most people are well-intended. They're self-correcting individuals. So withholding feedback that this individual is a few months behind where they should be and perhaps not displaying behaviors in alignment with our values and what success and engagement looks at at our firm was not going to serve anyone. It wasn't going to serve the individual. It wasn't going to serve the manager or me who are accountable for performance. And it wasn't going to serve the business, right? Constructive feedback drives performance and we can't stay in the way of it because of our discomfort. We just simply can't. So I hope this example is helpful, but since we've looked at what feedback means and we've defined that, I think a really great place for us to pivot is when do you give feedback? Because it's a question that I often get asked by my peers and colleagues and team. When is it appropriate to give feedback? And the answer is simple. You are to follow the golden rule. We have this golden rule, and some of you who've had experience with Brainard Strategy may have come across this, but our golden rule at Brainard Strategy is that you do not have the authority. I don't have the audacity to walk past an opportunity to give feedback when the observable behavior is significantly above the line or below the line. And we define the line by goals, competencies, and corporate values. How is that behavior in relation to the goals that we have set by the function or the role or, or the business? How is that behavior turning up in relation to the competencies needed to perform the job? And how is that behavior in alignment, misalignment to the corporate values? Not my personal values as Kay Bassett because they're subjective and could lead to a slippery slope, but the corporate values that have been established by my organization. And so if you have observed behavior that is above or below the line, relative to performance, against goals, against competencies, against our values, you must be compelled to give feedback. My ego, my discomfort, my comfort even, with giving feedback cannot have an opinion here. I am, when I'm faced with the opportunity to give feedback under this golden rule, I have to, I must be compelled to give feedback. I think the only exception is when there is emotion involved, when either I am emotional or, or frustrated or the recipient is going to be highly emotional. This emotion will hinder my ability to give smart, 
critical, effective feedback. I have to refrain until a time that the emotion has subsided to an extent that will allow me to follow through on this golden rule and give that feedback. So under this golden rule, we have to ask ourselves, how many feedback opportunities do I walk past on a daily basis? Really think about that. When this behavior is above or below the line, how many times am I choosing to walk past because of my discomfort or, or my distractions and not stopping to, to give this feedback? And once you've questioned that, I want you to also consider if I am seeing performance that is above the line or below the line, am I giving feedback that is proportionate to that performance? Am I overweight in feedback in some areas? Am I underweight in some areas? This is an important concept for us to consider next. To whom do you give feedback to? Now, I spoke about this earlier when I said that you're not to coach everyone. And one of the greatest truths that I have learned in my career is that you must treat your employees fairly, but not equally. Now, this is provocative, but think about it from a performance point of view. You can't treat your employees equally because not all performance is equal. Your employees do not perform equally. So in order to determine who you should give your coaching time to, you have to differentiate performance. You have to segment your employees into A, B, or C players. And I'll, I'll explore this a little bit more with you. When we say what we mean by A players and C players, the truth is intuitively you're able to determine right now, on, if you think about your teams, who are your A players, who are your C players? But some, some characteristics um, we've pulled up here for you. So you see performers have a tendency to blame others before blaming themselves. A players, you'll notice, will actively be looking at how they contribute to an issue, even if the issue isn't caused by them. They will ask things like, what could I have done better? They love getting feedback. And so a study that comes to mind is that conducted by a team of consultants about a couple of decades ago. So these consultants, like us, engaged a New Jersey-based company and they went to explore the difference between A and C players. So what they decided to do was ask these, this organization, give us a list of your employees that they consider to be high performers and who they consider to be low performers. Just give us the, a list of those people. Then the consultants administered kind of like a self-performance appraisal review. It was just a self-assessment given in the form of a paper pencil test. They simply asked, the individuals to evaluate their own performance. And what the study found was that the A players' performance evals were reading like C players, and the C players read like A players. The C players were hyping up their performance, took credit perhaps where it wasn't necessarily due, and A players were minimizing their own performance and were kind of tougher on themselves. They were giving themselves harsher feedback. They were always looking, thinking, there's a way I can improve here. Another way that A players and C players or performers differ is with their meeting effectiveness. You'll notice your C player will have a tendency to waste time in meetings, right? But you'll also notice your A player getting kind of frustrated by unproductive meetings. They I think we want to use their time more productively, so they hate sitting in unproductive meetings that are not giving them the productivity they need. They're looking to get out of that meeting so they can put their time towards more productive things. A players, it turns out, actually get demotivated by ineffective meetings. But the primary demotivator of A performers are C players. And the, the statistics around here are pretty significant. 80% of employees lose work time worrying about C players. And see, two, two thirds are losing work time avoiding toxic colleagues. These are significant statistics. Our A players' performance is being diminished by our C players. But where do we tend to spend majority of our time? We spend it, we spend our coaching calories with our C players. We 
are struggling to get performance out of our C players while at the same time diminishing the value of our A players. And these results show that. What we have to do is stop coaching our C players. There is diminishing return there. Instead, we have to reallocate our management calories. The time I spend trying to get performance out of my C players needs to be reallocated to my A and B players. And they're going to make your feedback job easy, right? Because they love getting feedback. They lo you just have to point out um, or prompt them on a situation or a behavior, and they're likely to self-correct and fix their own behavior. So it's a really important note here in terms of where we spend our, our management calories in terms of A or C players. The other important role you have in driving performance is setting performance in motion with intention. What I mean here is you have this trajectory of your performers. You want to move your A performers into superstars for tomorrow's leaders, tomorrow's players. You want to move your Bs to you become tomorrow's As. You want your Cs to become Bs. Now, not all C performers are alike. Some are new in their role, right? They, you need to be able to give them some time. You need to assess how to uh, approach them it correctly. However, there are C performers who have been exhibiting low performance and you're aware they've been exhibiting it for some time. You might need to demote them to a D player or even move them out of the role or the organization. They may be diminishing the productivity. They're an expense from a productivity perspective at this point. But regardless, you want to have your performance in motion and coaching is a great tool for that. See, I have actively made an effort. It's not going to be a surprise to any of my team who's listening on the call to not coach new members of my team. I manage them. I hope I often inspire them. I might even apply coaching skills in my dialogues with them, but I'm deliberately not choosing, or I'm deliberately choosing, I should say, to not coach them. I'm not sure yet if this newbie is going to be an A or B player or worthy of my coaching calories. I'll still manage and lead them, but I'm not going to apply my coaching calories there. And that might sound unreasonable, but we have to take into account what Pavlov's dog has taught us about reinforcement, about performance and behavior. Now, I'm a psych grad, so I, the study on Pavlov and his dog was probably turning up in Psych 101 for me. And, and many of you are probably already familiar with it. But the, essentially, the study found that what gets rewarded gets done. So if the dog rings the bell, he gets the treat, right? Pavlov showed us that if you can improve performance by your positive reinforcement and that you can extinguish poor performance, not by negative reinforcement, but by ignoring the behavior. Now, I'm not talking about feedback here. We still have to follow that golden rule. And feedback isn't meant to be punitive. Feedback is feedback. What I'm talking about when I say ignoring the behavior, what I'm really referring to is my coaching calories. If I coach my A player, if I choose to spend my time investing in coaching select B players who are perhaps showing spiky A player performances, it causes the others who are not in this category, who haven't been identified in this group, to consider what behaviors do I need to display to get into that room with, with my leader? What, what do I need to do to get my leader's time and investment into my development. I'm rewarding the expected behaviors of performance in my organization with my coaching calories, right? I, with my time. And so in this way, I'm using coaching to keep the performance in motion. My C's and B's who are not show, necessarily showing A's, they're going to be stretching and they're going to be stretching to try and reach the goal of getting into the room with me. And so this, 
there's a psychological impact here as we've seen by Pavlov, but really when you're choosing to allocate your coaching calories effectively, you're getting the performance to move by default. So I know I'm going to pause here because we've covered a lot of ground uh, and we're almost there. So bear with me. But what we want to do is, is look at how we coach, right? We've covered the what, we've covered the why, the when and the whom of feedback. But let's take a good look at how we coach. How do you give feedback? So here's a way of how not to give feedback. Um, I remember the first time I was given what looked like feedback. It was given to me in the form of this um, sandwich. It's also known by another name um, that I'm sure you can um, infer, but it's a very popular feedback tool or mechanism in, I believe, the 80s and 90s. But I remember my experience of this was going through a 20 minute of rambling feedback, statements given to me by my clearly uncomfortable with the situation manager. I was left confused and somewhat deflated, but I was mainly confused, right? And so I didn't know what to take action on. I, I still can't really recall the specificity of that feedback. I don't, and I have been told, Sarah tells me all the time, I have a great memory. <laughs> I, the key here is it just wasn't effective. Now, I've been really fortunate to be the recipient of highly effective and actionable feedback too. And, and here's a great model that is simple to use and has been proven to be effective in enforcing high performance, the performance we want to see, while extinguishing some poor performance. This SBI model was developed by the Center of Creative Leadership, and it's a highly effective performance tool. The S here stands for situation. So you want to begin by seeking to understand the situation. You want to clarify the questions to better enable you to provide effective feedback, right? So you want to gain some additional understanding. You might even have some going into the, the feedback situation, but you want to get their understanding so you can effectively deliver your feedback. This first piece, once you've done the situation, you can then effectively move to behavior. Here you're focusing on the specific behavior. We're not talking about positive, negative, positive here. The specific behavior, for example, Hey Sarah, I heard you were a little bit dismissive of that request last week. Did that occur? Did that not occur? That's some, you're trying to get some context around that, right? So you want to be very specific. Focus your questioning on the behavior. Once you're there, then you can speak about the impact. An impact here is how do you think your behavior is turning up? How do you think it's influencing, impacted your team or me as your leader or the organization? You want to, once you've clarified their behavior, you might want to question around, are they understanding the impact of the behavior? Because a lot of times people are well-intended. They don't have an understanding of that. So you have to drive them through, through this process to that impact point. Now with your A players, um, you won't likely need to go past situation or even the behavior. You might just prompt them and they'll self-correct the behavior. They'll come up with their own actions of how they need to correct that. They'll already understand the impact. You won't even have to go there. And so it's really impactful with your A players. And you can also, as well as your C players, and Sarah, I would love, um, because we're not able to do this through the webinar today, unfortunately, but we're going to shoot out a couple of video examples of how you can effectively use this model. We've got some role play videos that we can share with you, how you can use this model with your A and C players. Right, we will actually provide a recording of this webinar and the deck and we'll include that video when we do at that time. Great, great, great. See, the best thing about this model I find is that I'm not making 20 minute rambling statements. I'm not, even if I am uncomfortable with giving feedback, it's that I'm not having to do much of the talking. I'm just asking very clear, clarifying, thought-provoking questions around the situation, around the behavior, 
around the impact, right? I am not necessarily having to formulate all of my statements. Just through the questioning, you're getting the individual to get to an understanding of the impact of their behavior. Now, we've covered a lot of ground here today and probably at a, a, a speed that is probably fast, but I wanted to really dig into feedback here in a way to unpackage why it is this primary driver of performance, that it's your responsibility as a manager, as a leader, and as a coach to, to offer feedback that is, when you're observing that behavior that is above the line or below the line, you're offering that feedback that you might need to consider where you're spending your coaching calories and, and segmenting your A, B and C and even your D players and using your coaching skills at your discretion to, to keep that performance in motion, right? We spoke about that. The more you follow this golden rule we spoke about, the more consistent you're going to become. You're by default going to create trust within your team and those you give feedback to. You're going to automatically build credibility as a feedback provider. I would encourage you to let your employees know the golden rule and they can even use it internally with with their peers, if they observe behavior that's not above or below, that's above or below the line, I should say, with the your company's values. That I said, that's something that we're all responsible for, and we should give feedback to that to our peers, just to bring them to an awareness or to champion them if they're sharing it. Right? Feedback doesn't need to be critical or constructive. You need to also be proportionately giving your feedback for the the performance you're seeing that is driving the behaviors you and success you want to see in the organization and the function. So let your employees know, socialize this. You want to socialize this rule internally in such a way that your team knows even before you even have to try and think about forming it right, that this, that there is this feedback event that's occurring and that your feedback is coming from an objective place. It's coming from relation to the performance relative to goals, to the competencies that are needed for the job, and to your organization's values. You have to do some expectation setting there. But I'd say the most important outside of this is checking whether you yourself are postured for feedback. How often you are engaging your ecosystem for smart, right, critical feedback, the specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-bound feedback. Are you walking the talk? Are you leaning in? Are you effectively looking for opportunities to receive feedback? For example, I'm going to be disengaging from this, this webinar and I'll turn to Sarah and probably a couple of my, my peers on the call and, and lean into it. Hey, I think I was a little bit verbose in this section. Did I effectively get the message across that I was intending. These are just examples of how I have to be postured for feedback, how I have to be specific and intentional about the type of feedback I'm trying to, to, to receive. And so I encourage you to do the same, socialize the rules, socialize the models internally and be braced and, and postured to both receive feedback and give it effectively. Again, I think I've covered a lot here and um, I hope it's been of value to you that you're able to take a couple of tools and techniques to, to really effectively implement feedback tomorrow or even as you exit the situation. But for the interest of our time now, let's move over to seeing if we have any, any questions uh, coming in, Sarah. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all that information, Kay. I always love hearing, uh, covering those models, and each time I take a little bit more something away. So as we mentioned, we have the opportunity to take a few uh, questions, and we'll have a Q&A session. Again, in your black bar, there should be a thing that says Q&A. We will pull that up, and when we will begin, what we'll go ahead and do, because I believe only we can see those questions, we will um, read them out, and then Kay will provide a response for us. So I think the first question it looks like we have is, what if you have an employee who is generally an A player, but exhibits C player behaviors? I think that's a really good question. Uh, what if you have an employee who is generally an A player 
or exhibit superior behaviors? Well, I think you still, you sh this is a really good time to use your coaching calories, right? A players is where you want to be spending your coaching calories and A players will have flat spots. Everybody does. And so you want to perhaps get them in a conversation, put them through this uh, coaching process and get them to see how their behavior might be impacting their team, the organization, or, or their, their performance. They may not really have an understanding of how it might be in misalignment to, to what, what the role needs or, or what the stakeholders need or um, how it might be turning up and, and not necessarily as a strength, but as a, a development area. So this is where I would encourage, even if it's an A player exhibiting C player behaviors, that we lean in with our coaching calories. This is a good use of your coaching calories. Now, another question we had was, what if you want to be, what if I want to be timely with my feedback, but I'm still somewhat emotional about it? So what if I want to be timely with my feedback, but I want to be emotional? Um, you know, timely is a big concept, but I think my, my response here is that emotion trumps time, right? So if I am not, if I am emotional, when it comes to giving feedback and I'm feeling that frustration, no matter if that person is going to be flying out of um, the office and going back and I'm going to lose that face time with them to give them feedback, I have to halt my feedback. I have to refrain from giving it because when I'm emotional, not only does it hinder my ability to give feedback effectively, but when I'm really emotional, it starts becoming about, it's, it, it's, it's not about, giving my feedback that is it's not about giving effective feedback for that person's development it starts becoming about me wanting to express my emotions mm -hmm. and i think that can really hinder us right so i think where you want to think about when when i am emotional is do i want to be right or do i want to reach the right outcome and if i'm really emotional and i want to share that then the the key is to actually refrain now they've left town or they're out of time well, you're accountable to your peers to give feedback. And so you might want to just set up a call and be very intentional about it and say, hey, can we have a, uh, can we connect about this? Blah, 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 and go through your situation, go through your behavior, talk about the impact if you need to. But I wouldn't necessarily give feedback if I am emotional or the recipient is in a highly emotional state you will not give effect, uh, effective feedback and there may be your own personal biases that are hindering you from giving it effectively. So true. Usually when we tend to see feedback on sideways, right? Mm -hmm. Now, another question was, what do you do if you're given, if you've given an A or B player feedback multiple times, but they are just are not improving? So um, I think that's a good one. How do you give... A, please. So what we're talking about here, I think, is repeat offenders, right? You're giving them feedback, but they're just not going through. So you might have done the situation, you might have done the behavior, and you may have touched on the impact. The first place to start, in my recommendation, is to really increase the intensity of that impact, that I, right? Have you noticed that how this is turning up, um, is impacting our team and we noticed that it's kind of making us look as if we're difficult to work with do you know the impact it might have on me as a leader someone you look up to someone you respect that i'm not effectively driving the performance we need to see and, and, and your behaviors can be getting into that and if you really want to turn up the um, impact you might want to go to the i that is you right so how do you know what this behavior is going to have, this repeated behavior is going to have on your career mobility? I know where you want to go. Have you, have you considered that? So these, just turning up the eye, I think it's a really great place to start um, with repeat offenders. But at some point, you might have to consider performance management, right? Sometimes if you're giving feedback and your feedback is a gift, 
It's a gift that you're choosing to give at you uh, at your disposal. And so if they are not responding to it, if they are not um, not that they don't have they have a blind spot because the blind spot with the eye you can turn that up, but if they are choosing to still not respect, then you have to put them on a user performance measure to get that behavior. Because remember, if that behavior is, is not just impacting them, but it's taking away from productivity, it's, it's literally costing the productivity and engagement of your team. If it gets to that point, you have to address it from a performance point of view. Um, let's see some of the other questions we've got here. I think we've got uh, time for probably one or two more. How do you get your direct reports to give you feedback? I asked mine, but they don't want to. Um, I'm going to start answering this, but I might even put it over to Sarah, who's on my team, and, and see um, what has got her to give me feedback. So asking it is, is, is one way. But have you been specific with what you're asking? Generally asking, like, hey, let me know, you know, you're I'm, I have open, I'm going to give you feedback, I want you to give me feedback, it's great. But you want to be asking for smart, critical, specific feedback. And they'll know that it's their responsibility to share that with you. So again, when I come out of this webinar, I'll say to Sarah, hey, was I, did I effectively sh share that message correctly? When I was going over the coaching story, did that really hit the nail on the head or, hey, you know, I know we had that meeting last week and I know we're under time pressure and I'm really pushing us through and I'm being a little bit executionary right now. Uh, am I giving you what you need in this situation? Or you've just transitioned into this role that was previously my responsibility and, and I'm trying to help you, but I don't want to overstep um, here. I want to really empower you. Am I giving you uh, that space to really grow. Can you give me some feedback here? I think a way to really, to really get your employee um, and, and your team to give feedback is to be a lot more specific about what you're asking, right? Sarah, what would you add, add to that? No, I think that's so true. That smart, critical question that you're asking people is a huge part of it. But I think one of the things that we talk a lot about that actually you've taught me is that building that trust and a really big piece of building that trust is also demonstrating the vulnerability. I am fallible. I am not perfect. I've had situations like this in the past. So putting yourself out there a little bit that way often helps. I think the one other thing is that it takes time, right? The first time you asked me for feedback, I looked behind my shoulder and said, where's the hidden camera, right? We have that yeah, experience. Right. We yeah. often have that experience if it's not something that's part of your culture. So it takes time to demonstrate that also feedback isn't always a call to the principal's office. It's just, hey, I'm intending to just get a little bit more self-awareness. So I think it's that humble, I am fallible, uh, demonstrating vulnerability approach, as well as it's just something we do often not something that says come in close the door i want you to give me some feedback yeah no i think that's that's very true i think being open and vulnerable and just demonstrating again and again and again sarah what are the three things that really um influence and uh drive performance it's our language our behaviors and our incentives so if we're demonstrating on a repeated not as an event but as a uh, consistent process and we're, we're keep seeking and then we give feedback hey listen I'm asking for feedback and I want to be able to give you what what you need and I'm trying to I want to give the business and what I'm accountable for so I really need you to just lean in here and give me feedback and and try and create that trust and that openness it may just be a result of the culture and so you might be up against that but you know, slowly, slowly, slowly with consistency, with similar language and messaging, can you really incentivize them to give feedback? Um, another question here, let's see. How, how do you diffuse defensiveness from the recipient? I think that's a, a really, really great question. Um, so we're, it really, the, the thing that I like to lead to is, you know, we've always talked about having that introspection. What are you seeing here? What are you seeing as behaviors? But it's not an event. When you're seeing defensiveness, you need to have them go through a very difficult process. And so in those situations, I get the individual to start seeking feedback from other, other members. Just seek insight. 
okay i i see let's let's um let's reality check this let's let's and and maybe you don't have to be that aggressive with your language but you can say okay you know i'd love for you to explore just speak to x y and z and just just don't try to respond to the feedback they're giving just be receptive just seek to understand ask clarifying questions then at a later point you can have another conversation where you might be able to give perspective but for this first phase i want you to just seek feedback and come back with me let's let's review the feedback you've received and let's see uh you know kind of take it like our kidneys our kidneys work by flushing everything out and then we take back the stuff that we need to really that our body needs and so positive and constructive feedback acts like those vitamins and minerals for us and so i'd say get them to really go out into their environment get that feedback from a select few stakeholders and make sure you're aware of those who they are. You don't want them to hedge the bets in their favor. You want them to have a real good reality check on, on, on their feedback. And so what I'll notice typically is where there is defensiveness is now there's open perspective where I was defensive because of my self perception, my introspection, going out, looking outward into my environment and seeking the opinions of others who I respect or I value is going to help diminish, maybe not diminish, uh, extinguish this defensiveness. That could be just something that this individual has, but it will diminish it and it will diminish the weight of whatever they are defending. So, Sarah, do we have time for one more or should we be wrapping up? Maybe we can take just one more question. Okay, let's see. I am loving, loving, loving these questions coming in. Um, I think we've covered a few of these are very similar in terms of repeat of offenders. Do you find that C players are able to transition to B or A players with feedback, given the right feedback? To an extent, right to an extent i think i think that um giving c players were are likely to to go to a or b players feedback will be a second part of the mechanism i use the first piece i would do is the expected behaviors sometimes c players have no idea they might be aware of the goals they may be aware of the competencies but what are the expected behaviors that demonstrate engagement and success to get you to a player or b player what are what are what are those expected behaviors it's not necessarily task mastery of what you're responsible for it may just be um, engaging the system the organization the employees in a different way and so i think the first piece is very crucial in not just setting goals but setting the expected behaviors that will get them there and sometimes as leaders we tend to hold this back we we, we say okay these are the goals hit this by the end of the year or in this time period but we don't necessarily tell them the behaviors that will help them get there so the first piece is expected behaviors then you can use when you start seeing that that behavioral change you can start and and now you're assessing now that they have those expected behaviors now we're assessing what is above or or um if their performance is above or below the line to that expected behavior now you can give feedback appropriately more specifically in relation to that behavior and if they're an starting to respond to that feedback then you want to start using your coaching calories there right there's potential you're starting to see that performance in motion and so that is how you can get c performers to to move into b or a players but be careful because some c performers may not be be open to that feedback will will likely blame others in some ways and so you might want to consider demoting them to d players as we spoke about perhaps they're not the right fit for the role um, or, or the organization in that in that way well i think that's all we have time for in terms of questions goodness thank you all very much for your time today and kate thank you so much for sharing all of that insight with us as i said before i just it, i always take something new away every every time we t i hear you talk about this topic it's not, we've gone through a lot today and it's not easy to retain everything. You may take one, two, 
10, 25% of what we shared. But if you are at all interested in this topic, learning a little bit more about how to create some stickiness or diving deeper into this topic for you, um, your colleagues um, or your teams, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have provided our website here, brainerdstrategy.com. You can certainly reach out to us to all of the various social media channels that you may have um, discovered our webinar through today and we'll respond to you. Info at Brainerd Strategy is a great place uh, to hear a little bit more about us and, and we can respond to any requests you have. If we didn't have a chance to respond to your question and answer, please feel free to email us. We'd love to, to give you some insight and be sure we, we provide you with some support in your requests. And we will be able to provide you with a recording of this webinar today and the video that Kay mentioned. Thank you all very much for your time and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day.